questions. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming uh, to, to listen to my presentation. Well, of course, I'm very honored to be the recipient of the Cassini Medal. Uh, uh, I will try to, uh, to give a few highlights of uh, my work as mostly the Cassini Huygens uh, uh, study and project scientist at ESA. But I want to cover, in fact, all the activities uh, with a, a special bias, of course, that uh, I've been involved with regarding a bit of my research and the ESA Planetary Science uh, Program. So um, <clears throat> first of all, it's very difficult, of course, to acknowledge everyone whom I've been collaborating with. So I'm using this, the next illustration, this one, and the next one to, uh, to thank all my uh, colleagues I've been working on with for, uh, I would say, almost a Saturn year uh, on the cassini huygens uh, mission. So uh, thanks to all of them, and thanks, of course, to those who are here uh, today. Uh, I also want to express some thanks to the Huygens team. Um, yes, this is the Huygens team. Um, we had the uh, wonderful fortune to, um, to have a, a prime contractor who was in a very nice place uh, in, uh, on the French Riviera, and sometime we could get uh, uh, very close to the sea. So this is one photograph of the participants to a review. I, I can't remember exactly when it was taken, uh, but it was early on in the development phase of Huygens. And this is uh, all the, well, not all, but a good part of the people who were involved in designing, building, and uh, getting Huygens ready for launch. So I would really like to express uh, my thanks to them. Unfortunately, some of them have left us already. But uh, I think it's really, they are really the one who know how hard it was to, to drop something in, uh, in the foggy atmosphere of Titan. And um, it was a bit hard. OK, uh, so this is a, a, a very brief uh, resume of my career. Um, I was educated as a plasma physicist at CNRS in Orléans. And after my PhD, I moved to ESAS Tech as a postdoc. And for about two years, um, I was free to do laboratory work. This is one of the activities I like to do. So I did some laboratory work and uh, some data analysis. At that time, it was, uh, I was working a bit on GEOS. And then, in 1980, uh, I, I became um, a staff scientist um, at uh, STEC, and I've been involved in what I call science management duties. Uh, and I think uh, my role there was to serve the community, and I hope I did, uh, well, I surely did my best, and I hope uh, I did well. Uh, in, in the early 80s, I was, I think I had the fortune to be involved in Space Lab One. Uh, this was really a very interesting international collaboration, and I think I've learned a lot uh, in, uh, by working on this mission for a few years. Uh, I, I was also uh, responsible, the technical responsible for one of the experiments, so I really um, enjoyed it, and I think I learned a lot, and this, uh, few years really, I believe, prepared me for, for the next step in my activities. So in 1984, uh, I became the Cassini study scientist. I have to tell when I, I was uh, asked to, to be the study scientist of uh, the Cassini mission, uh, I knew little about Titan. So I knew it was a moon of Saturn, but I'm not sure uh, I knew much more than that. So. Um, it was interesting for me to jump into the, into the planetary exploration at that time. So I was a study scientist for uh, five years, and then 
when the mission was selected, I will not go through the steps of, uh, of mission study and mission selection. I mean, this was uh, a study in collaboration between ESA and NASA, between Europe and the States. It did not go uh, that smoothly, but uh, I think this is normal. I think when establishing a big collaboration program, there are uh, some little difficulties, but uh, we went over all the difficulties. And in 1989, 1990, the mission got started on both sides of the Atlantic. And <clears throat> I became the uh, project scientist um, uh, in 1989. And I even became the mission manager for Huygens in early 2000 or 2001. And um, uh, I'm not anymore the uh, project scientist because uh, I'm going to retire very soon from ESA. So I've, um, uh, I've stopped this activity uh, in February. Uh, as uh, I had a bit of time in the early 2000 to do something else, I was asked to be the study scientist for the uh, Venus Express mission. And I think I really enjoyed this as well. I, I met uh, people who are looking at the inner planet rather than people looking at the outer planet. So this was a very good experience for me as well. Um, and um, late in, uh, well, a few years ago, I became the study scientist for the Titan Saturn system mission and the Europa Jupiter system mission, uh, which we have been again studying in collaboration between e ESA and, uh, and NASA for a few years. Eventually, the EGSM mission uh, was down-selected for the next step, and I was a study scientist until February as well. But as part of my um, research activities, I have been doing some, inf uh, some flight instrument development, and I really um, uh, want to stress this, because this has been um, I mean, really at the core of my research activities. And I think it kept me um, uh, well uh, aware of instrument development, uh, difficulties for accommodating instruments, and so on. And uh, I was involved in several missions. Um, mostly, uh, my field is plasma diagnostics. So the two instruments uh, I've been involved with are Langmuir probes and the mutual impedance probe. And I will uh, say a few words on those two instruments later and I just continue doing uh, laboratory work uh, <clears throat> for the next, for the past 30 years, and I'm continuing now. So this is an outline of my talk. Um, I will give a very brief overview of the ESA solar system missions, uh, and then I will spend a few slides uh, talking about my activities regarding instrument development, I will uh, explain, for those who don't know, um, the principle of a Langmuir probe and a mutual impedance probe for uh, plasma diagnostics. And I will show some selected uh, results from Rosetta, not as a comet yet, but during the Earth flyby, and some Cassini results, which, um, have been <clears throat> which are shared by uh, one of my Swedish uh, colleagues. Uh, I will say, give one slide on the study scientist activities for Venus Express. I also want to mention Ulysses uh, because Ulysses, uh, I mean, flew by Jupiter for um, uh, a gravity assist purpose. But I think Ulysses has done some very nice work, uh, a bit on, on Jupiter, of course, but. Uh, it, it has raised a very interesting puzzle on Saturn, and I will talk a bit about that. And then most of my talk uh, will be on the Cassini uh, uh, study scientist, uh, project scientist activities, and I will try to summarize uh, some of the uh, science highlights we are getting with that mission. And I'll just say one word on the EGSM uh, activities. And I will be looking into the future. I will try to look into the future. OK, so this is the, uh, the map of the solar system with the names of all the missions that ESA is involved with. I mean, you can uh, read them. So Ulysses, Baby Colombo, Soho, Venus Express, Smart One, Giotto, uh, the Mars Express, uh, which is orbiting, and the two missions um, under development. Uh, the ExoMars uh, mission, which has been split in two in collaboration with NASA, the 
TGO, Trace Gaze Orbiter 2016, and the uh, Rovers uh, 2018, uh, EGSM Laplace a study um, we are conducting, and Cassidy Huygens and Rosetta. And I think I did not miss any, but I was, I'm of course missing two. Uh, I thought, yes. Uh, there are two missions which are um, a candidate for as mission in the ESA uh, Cosmic Vision Program, the Solar Orbiter and uh, the uh, Marco Polo uh, um, asteroid uh, sam um, sample return. So those are candidates. They are not appearing on my biograph, but I wanted to mention them. And my involvement is, um, I mean, I'm involved somewhat in all the missions which are in the uh, red bubble. Uh, in, at different levels. I was not involved myself in Giotto, but I always considered Giotto as uh, really uh, a very uh, interesting mission. I mean, at that time, ESA was able to develop, and the science community, by the way, was able to develop uh, and launch a mission within five years, so which is not really the case anymore. So Giotto was really a, an heroic um, um, a mission for ESA and the European science community. So I am in, involved in, uh, in all the missions which are in, uh, in red. So I switch now to instrument development, uh, <clears throat> Lamia probe. So the Lamia probe is a very simple instrument. It's simply a biased electrode um, which, which has a few, uh, which has an area of a few, collecting area of a few square centimeters. And it's immersed in the plasma you want to measure. The current voltage characteristic, which you uh, acquire by varying the uh, bias voltage, is a diagnostic for the plasma electron density, the plasma ion density, although this is more difficult, the plasma temperature, and the plasma uh, potential, or the spacecraft potential with respect to the plasma. It's a very simple and versatile instrument, but the interpretation is rather difficult, rather complex, and it has a lot of, uh, of uh, caveats to, um, to be able to interpret correctly. But very simple instrument. The electrode can be a sphere, uh, a small cylinder, or even a plate. In my opinion, and sometime I'm, I'm going to express my opinion, it's a must instrument when exploring new planetary environment. And I think we really have good examples. The Pioneer Venus um, uh, uh, spacecraft had uh, a Lamia probe. Uh, Larry Brace was um, the PI. The Cassini uh, ra radio and plasma wave uh, uh, system has a Lamia probe. Uh, and Yann-Eric Vallon is a co uh, responsible co for this Lamia probe. Rosetta Plasma Consortium has a Lamia probe. Anders Ericsson is a PI, and I am going to advocate um, uh, that such a Lamia probe, simple instrument, should be uh, seriously considered for the EGSM Laplace mission, uh, because we are going to explore uh, new environment, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto, and I think a, a Lamia probe would fit quite nicely in this um, exploratory mission, in a sense. This is my view, of course. Uh, so this is a principle of a Lamia probe, so the electrode. Uh, I am um, modeling the uh, plasma uh, by uh, this uh, simple network. This is a variable plus uh, resistance due to the electron collection. This is the variable resistance due to the ion collection, which is about 100 times higher. And um, we collect on the electron when we polarize positive, ions where we collect uh, polarized negative. And we, va we vary the potential and we measure the current. So this is a classical IV curve, a slightly a negative, well, this is a convention for the ion current. You go through the so-called floating potential and then you go positive. Uh, another way uh, to represent is uh, to take the logarithm of the absolute um, uh, value, and you have this, uh, this, uh, this type of curve. So this is um, <clears throat> what you get 
we will run your probe and this is what you have to analyze. But it's not as simple as it may look. Uh, one, uh, one of the uh, problems I'm currently working on is the effect of ions on the IV curve. And uh, this is illustrating uh, the uh, electron uh, collection, uh, current collection with three geometries, a plate geometry, a cylinder geometry, or a spherical geometry. And this is illustrating the ion collection. In this case, uh, we have a thermal plasma, no, uh, no beaming effect, uh, which is, of course, not the case if you are in, the, in flight because the, the spacecraft is streaming through the ion uh, velocity, uh, the ion population. So this is um, uh, more repre rep better represented here. The th um, for the three geometries, uh, this is what you would get with, for the ion, uh, ion collection. And this is a total current. And this is a case in between when you have about 50% of uh, thermal ions and 50% of beaming ions. And you can see that the ion, uh, the electron part is not affected because the ion current is much smaller. But really the ion current is significantly different whether you have beaming ions or thermal ions or a mixture. So this is uh, something I'm uh, working with at the moment. Um, one problem I'm also working on, which is really, um, I should not say fascinating, uh, I should say more annoying, is a problem of a contamination layer. I mean, the surface of, uh, of, a, uh, of the sensor is never ideal, and there is always some contamination, either due to um, uh, launch preparation activities or even in flight, uh, it, can, it can be recontaminated. And um, so this is something I'm also working on because I am involved in one of the, uh, in one mission which has a Lambert probe which may have some contamination. And I really have to, to try to understand the effect of the contamination to remove it in order to be able to analyze properly the data. If you, if you look at it in a simple way, this, uh, the IV characteristic is different if you sweep up or down. There is a charging effect due to the time constant of the contamination layer, which can be a few seconds. And this is uh, what I'm working on at the moment. I'm doing some lab work. I'm doing uh, <coughs> uh, uh, some um, uh, modelization, modeling of this. And I think there was a very interesting study uh, by Peel, uh, which looked at this for analyzing uh, uh, rocket data. And I think this is. Uh, it, it, it really demonstrated, they really demonstrated that it's possible, although you may have a contaminated Lambda probe, to remove the effect during the analysis. I switched to mutual impedance probe. So this is a, a very different instrument. Uh, this is a radio frequency instrument. You inject uh, a current, either with a, uh, with a dipole or a monopole, and you measure the induced potential with a, a dipole, a receiving dipole. And the impedance of the system is represented here as a function of frequency, has some characteristic features which allow you to determine the plasma density, or well, the plasma frequency, therefore the density. There is a, a maximum, we call a resonance. And <clears throat> there are minimum, or we call anti-resonances, which are a function of the um, the by lengths, very characteristic uh, lengths uh, in a plasma. It's it's related to the temperature and the density. So also the amplitude of the resonance is a function of the by length. So this is a very uh, different way of measuring basically the same parameters, and. Uh, it's, it has some complementarity and also some overlapping with a Lambert probe. So we have uh, such a, a set of instruments on the Rosetta uh, Plasma Consortium, and, uh, which uh, has uh, five uh, different instruments and a DPU. Uh, so the Lambert probe here is led by Anders Ericsson, and the mutual impedance probe is led by Jean-Gabriel Protignon from Orléans. And in the, uh, in the, during the Rosetta mission at the comet, 
we are going to encounter a very unusual plasma. The plasma is going to be very cold. The uh, ion and electron temperature may be as cold as 100 Kelvin. And I think this is really a challenge for those instruments, and I would say possibly especially for the Lamy Pro, because it's very difficult to measure low temperatures. So really it's a complementarity of the Lamy probe and the mutual impedance probe is going to be extremely useful, in my opinion, uh, at, at the comet when we get there. And it's not excluded that there may be some contamination due to the very specific, I would say, dirty environment of the comet, which could affect the Lamy probe. So having such a complementary set of measurements is going to be, to be useful. So I'm, I'm involved in, uh, in those two instruments. Uh, to give an example of what we uh, measure with, uh, with the Rosetta mutual impedance probe, I use the, uh, the case of the third Earth flyby. So this is, um, uh, so this is time. Uh, so this is in the active mode when the uh, emitting dipole is really active. And we measure the, um, so I mean a vertical line would be a measure of one impedance, and then as a function of time, we measure the uh, evolution, variation of the impedance, and we see that the, the, uh, the resonance is very pronounced at the upper hybrid frequency. When there is a magnetic field, it's not a plus of frequency, it's the upper hybrid frequency. Uh, we have two modes for Rosetta because we uh, expect to encounter such a wide range of plasma uh, parameters that we have the uh, mutual impedance probe itself with its own, uh, I could show it here. Uh, so this is the sensor, the emitting dipole, I would not remember which one it is, and the receiving dipole. Uh, so it's a self-consistent instrument, but when we are in the long, the bi-length, uh, low density, high temperature, uh, we use a Lamia probe as a transmitting electrode. So which allows to cover a much wider range of the bi-lengths. And this has been tested during the Earth flyby, and this has been uh, working, this is really working very well. So this demonstrate, so this is the amplitude and this is the phase. So this, is, this demonstrate very well that the <coughs> uh, mutual impedance probe, we don't have uh, the uh, result for the Lamy probe, but is a very capable instrument to, that is well adapted, well suited, for exploring the wide range of uh, plasma parameters we expect at the comet. And I'm really looking forward to the arrival of, of Rosetta <coughs> at the comet in 2014. Um, so the uh, other Lamy probe instrument I'm involved with is, uh, is flying, not anymore, while well, it's still flying, but the satellite has been switched off a few weeks ago on the French uh, uh, Demeter, <coughs> Demeter satellite. Uh, <coughs> this is a low Earth orbiting satellite uh, whose prime objective was to measure the uh, effect induced in the ionosphere by earthquake and uh, seismic activity, volcanic activity. Uh, we have collected about six years of excellent data. So the data analysis uh, is uh, proceeding. And <clears throat> so we, uh, I have two Lamy probe. I was responsible for that instrument. I have two Lamy probe. One is a classical cylindrical probe. Uh, and this one is spherical probe. And I have um, uh, designed uh, what I call a segmented uh, spherical Lamy probe, where the sphere is divided in several sectors, which provides some directivity to the Lamy probe, to the spherical Lamy probe. And uh, this, uh, this was. Uh, this one is the one which was normally used. The one has been used for a few uh, test cases because this was really an experiment. And I have to say that I'm still um, uh, behind anal analyzing the true performance of the sensor, but we have acquired some good data to do that. And I want to mention that uh, a similar probe is flying only the segmented one on uh, Proba 2, another small satellite, this time from ESA. And this is in the framework of a really excellent collaboration 
I've developed with a, a group in Czech Republic from Prague under the leadership of Pavel Stranicek uh, and Stevan Zverek. So we are really um, looking forward to a full uh, uh, use of this uh, uh, segmented lambda probe in fact there are two on probe two and to, uh, to um, char characterize it as a plasma, I would say a, a very powerful plasma diagnostic method. So lab work, I'm just illustrating uh, some of the lab work I'm doing by two pictures, so I will not, uh, so this is a Demeter Lamy probe, I won't say more. So now I switch to uh, Venus Express. <coughs> Uh, so Venus Express was designed as a low cost opportunity for reusing again after MEX because MEX, Mars Express was really the first mission to reuse Rosetta. So for reusing the second time elements of the Rosetta platform. And I must say the study scientist activities were a bit uh, different from usual because we really had the a uh, very strong, uh, um, I mean, guidelines to be able to, um, to design the mission. And they were, in a sense, very challenging because not only it included the mission definition, but also a sort of uh, payload pre-selection. And uh, I mean, some of my colleagues who were part of the science team um, um, are, are here and they may remember how exciting it was to design in about a year a mission a third mission to reuse, uh, to reuse the Rosetta uh, platform. So I think uh, the outstanding results from MEX and VEX really demonstrate that the soundness of the approach, which was a, a low budget approach, is, was feasible. And I think there may be some lessons to be learned in the current uh, climate where uh, budgets are declining. And uh, Dima uh, Titov, uh, my uh, dear colleague, uh, will uh, highlight uh, the results for both MEX and VEX in his medal lecture tomorrow. So if you want to uh, hear more about MEX and, and VEX, uh, uh, go to Dimas' talk tomorrow. I just want to say uh, one thing about the ESA mission because we are archiving the data and uh, although you can't probably see, but in the ESA planetary science archive, we have, we have archived all the uh, planetary, all the data from the planetary mission. And uh, we have uh, from the bottom, SMART-1, which was a, a mission around the moon, Venus Express, Rosetta, Mars Express, uh, Giotto, the Giotto have, uh, data archive, Huygens and Bepi Colombo uh, preparatory work. So, I mean, those who really want to, um, to get access to the, to the archive and do their own research using archive data, I really invite you to do so. I mean, the access is uh, pretty good, and uh, uh, well, there is plenty of data which are probably waiting for you to, to get online, so please do so. So I move to the outer planets. So the outer planets which have been visited so far are uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. And I just know that uh, all missions but one, all spacecraft but one, use uh, RTGs, uh, <coughs> radioisotope thermal generators. The one, the first one at Jupiter, which will not use RTG, is Juno, which is due to be launched in August this year. It is using solar panel. And the EGSM ESA uh, contribution to GSM Laplace, the Jupiter Ganymede Orbiter, is also designed with solar panels. So this <coughs> would be the second mission to go to Jupiter um, with solar panels. So <coughs> uh, Ulysses, as I said, used Jupiter as a gravity assist body, but it had a very interesting trajectory. Uh, New Horizon also used uh, uh, Jupiter for gravity assist. The Galileo probe explored Jupiter with both an orbiter and a probe. And uh, Juno is supposed to last what well, it has. It is designed for a lifetime of one year, and it may be extended to two years if the radiation environment is not too harsh on Juno. Saturn, we had a flyby uh, by Pioneer and the Voyagers, and we are currently exploring Saturn with the Cassini Orbiter and the Huygens uh, Titan probe uh, went down to Titan. 
and Uranus and Neptune, we had the Voyager 2, Uranus, and Neptune flyby. So Ulysses, uh, so this is my one slide on Ulysses, and this is a trajectory, so it was launched, and then it uses um, uh, Jupiter for gravity as his body, and I think this is a, uh, the latitude uh, magnetic, uh, the coverage in magnetic latitude, and this is, I think, the um, only trajectory which has explored such high uh, latitude, uh, magnetic latitude regions. So there are, there are probably some very interesting data. I'm sure they have been looked at, but we could probably use those data uh, when we go back to Jupiter with uh, EGSM. Unfortunately, uh, some of the instruments, uh, which were not really designed to operate properly in the high radiation environment, were switched off. But uh, I think there were three instruments uh, which were operating during the uh, Jupiter flyby. And I will return to Ulysses a bit later. So now uh, <clears throat> I switch to Cassini-Huygens. And I always like to say that uh, those two scientists, Huygens and Cassini, um, have been um, cooperating at European level um, 330 years ago to explore Saturn. So the exploration of Saturn is um, is always done in cooperation, I mean, um, between France and Italy, or Italy and France, and Holland uh, 350 years ago, and now we have this international uh, cassini huygens mission. So uh, this is an illustration of, um, of the uh, mission, so Cassini, the orbiter, and the Huygens probe. So Huygens is the one who discovered uh, the, the true nature of the rings, he really identified those uh, as rings around Saturn, and while observing Saturn, is the one who discovered Titan in 1655. And Cassini is the one who discovered several of the uh, Saturn satellites, Iapetus, Rhea, Thetis, and Dion, and he also is the one who identified this uh, gap in between the two rings, uh, which, is, which was called later the uh, Cassini uh, division. Uh, I count that the Cassini mission, and I will uh, give more detail later, started in 1982, and it will hopefully go on, it has been approved, to go on till 2017, so this lasts 36 years. So this is, uh, I mean, planetary missions are long, and uh, 36 years, this is um, quite a number. So uh, briefly, the idea for Cassini uh, was um, um, developed over the last years before the Voyager flyby and really um, became um, mature uh, just, I would say, a few weeks or a few months after the, uh, the uh, <laughs> flyby by Voyager. So, and in 1982, uh, a team of uh, scientists from Europe and the States made a proposal to ESA uh, to, um, uh, for such a mission. It was obvious, of course, that this would have to be done in collaboration with NASA. This is what happened. And uh, we did some studies, uh, joint studies, from 1984 to 1988. And this is, in fact, when I joined the mission. Uh, <clears throat> I think, in a sense, I was very fortunate that I was, at that time, a young scientist, at least younger than now. Uh, and uh, I was able to go through the whole mission. And uh, I mean, this is really, uh, for a planetary scientist, which I became eventually, I guess, it's really uh, very interesting to have the opportunity to, uh, to go along with the development and the implementation of the mission. So I was really very fortunate. So the development of the mission um, uh, lasted about seven years, and we. Uh, there are three agencies, NASA, ESA, and the Italian Space Agency, which is providing some uh, specific elements for the uh, radio and the radar and some other instruments. So it's a three agency instrument, as illustrated by the logos here. So we launched in 97. It took seven years to get to Saturn. And um, we were supposed, I mean, Cassini was supposed to last uh, four years. This was a prime mission, but it was extended first <clears throat> till 2010, mid-2010, and we went through the equinox configuration, uh, very interesting. 
and Cassini had uh, some unique views of this configuration. And now Cassini is, um, is in its uh, second extension and it has been approved uh, to go till uh, 2017. Uh, so this, those are the, this is a spacecraft, uh, this is a, a, an assembly, this is a test model of Huygens, and this is Huygens as a flight model, which is being assembled in Europe before it was shipped for <coughs> being mated to Cassini. Uh, so this is the solar system, these both are the eight planets. Uh, I had to blank the ninth uh, Pluto. Um, so those are the eight planets of the uh, uh, solar system. And the point I want to, to, to illustrate here is that both the Earth, Mars, and Saturn have uh, an inclined uh, spin axis. And this is, uh, this is a reason why we have seasons. We have seasons, as we know, at Earth. We have seasons at Titan. We have seasons at Saturn. And most of the reason for the season is inclined um, uh, spin axis. And of course, as Titan is orbiting um, in the uh, <coughs> equatorial plane of Saturn, we also have seasons at Saturn. And uh, Saturn's orbit around the sun is about 29 years, 29.5 years. A season is seven years. So with Cassini at Saturn for almost 14 years, we are going to be able to cover uh, two seasons. And we are already seeing now uh, seasonal effect. Uh, I mean, some of the observations uh, were discussed uh, this morning in the Titan session. So clearly, the next few years are going to be very rich in terms of observing the seasonal, seasonal effect at Saturn. But not only uh, of the planet or the moon, but also on the rings, uh, the magnetosphere. I mean, the whole system is somewhat governed by uh, seasonal effect. So this is one of the main objectives for the, uh, for the Cassini mission in the next uh, few years. Saturn is big. Um, this is uh, to scale the Earth's moon distance, and uh, it's, it's a big system, and it takes just a few weeks, sometimes more than a month, to make one orbit around Saturn. So we, um, we do not have that many orbits in a sense. So this is illustrating the trajectory. Uh, seen from the pole or seen from the equator uh, that Cassini has been uh, uh, doing around Saturn for the first four years. Uh, so it really moved around and it used, Cassini used Titan as a gravity assist uh, body to shape the trajectory, to rotate the, uh, the ellipse, but also to change inclination. So a real piece of uh, real navigation by JPL's navigators, and they are really so good at that, uh, that you can really almost do any trajectory you want. Uh, and uh, we have long stories about designing, redesigning uh, trajectories for this prime mission, for the first extension, for the second extension. So, I mean, this is marvelous what, um, what they can do. Um, so this is uh, presenting the science objectives as we defined them very early on in the mission. We had identified five classes of science objectives, the magnetosphere, Titan, Saturn, the rings, and the icy satellites. And this is the way the Cassini science team is organized. And it's really organized around those five disciplines. So I think we had some real stability in terms of uh, pursuing the objectives of the mission. I think this stability uh, is, uh, is probably one, uh, one of the nice elements in working with Cassini because, uh, I mean, we have those five disciplines, but also uh, this is um, really um, allowing cross-discipline interaction. And in fact, uh, the, the science team are really, I think, interacting very nicely together now. And um, early on, you know, everybody had to give a bit to be able to do its science, but now it seems like everyone is happy, and uh, what they get for the ex second extension is, uh, is great. So the, the Cassidy team have managed to be, um, to be good at sharing across discipline resources which are available uh, for the mission. So congratulations to, um, to the teams. 
so this is uh, orbit insertion. Well, um, I will have to skip one slide because I had one with sound. So this is just illustrating how dairy it was at that time. And um, we had a JPL, and there was a JPL at that time. We had one signal which we were eventually getting when we went in orbit around Saturn. And it took more than one hour to get the information. I mean, we had one hour delay because of the light uh, uh, travel time. So we will not wait for one hour, but this is eventually what we got at JPL, uh, almost real time. And this was a signal that we were all waiting for, and eventually that it would stop. This was indicating the Doppler shift as Cassidy was slowing down and eventually be put in orbit around Sergio. And when we got that signal, um, I mean, there was, there was some real celebration. I think this was really a true moment in, uh, in uh, well, I guess it was the 30th of June, 2004 at JPL. Really an emotional moment. The spacecraft after, after seven years was in orbit around Sergio. And I can see that Dave Southwood and Ed Weiler are celebrating with peanuts. I think this is a box of peanuts. <laughs> okay, so this I won't show because uh, there was sound. So this is illustrating the uh, change of inclination of, uh, of, the, uh, of Saturn along the, uh, the mission duration. So we had the prime mission, the first <laughs> extension, and the second extension. <laughs> And um, really, I want to emphasize the fact that we have a, a wonderful opportunity to study, uh, to study uh, seasonal effects. And um, so this was a prime mission. We went through the equinox in, in the middle of the solstice mission. And now, today, we are about here. In, uh, we are going to uh, <coughs> northern solstice. Uh, one of the image I like most uh, from, uh, from Cassini, this is an image uh, of Saturn. Uh, we, uh, we see the night side of Saturn, but nothing is dark at Saturn because there are so many uh, reflections. Uh, the, uh, the sun is, um, is, go uh, is uh, going through the, uh, the haze, the high atmosphere haze. So uh, we even see the, the rings, which are back reflected on the night side of Saturn. Uh, there is one little dot here, which uh, is supposed to be the Earth. So this is how we see the Earth uh, from, um, from Cassini, from Saturn. So this is one of the images, which is in fact a montage from more than, probably more than 100 images uh, taken by Cassini. This is one of the images I really like most about, um, about Saturn as returned by Cassini. Um, a few postcards from, uh, um, from Cassini-Huygens. So this is uh, uh, rings, and we see long shadows here. This was during the equinox, uh, when the sun was incident was really close to zero, and any structure in the rings um, uh, created those long shadows. And this has been, this has, this configuration has allowed to discover really uh, many new features in, in the rings like those vertical structures. Uh, this is um, the, big, uh, the big vortex um, at, uh, at Saturn. Uh, I uh, can't remember whether it's the north of the South Pole. Uh, this is Enceladus, and I'm going to come back to Enceladus because this is really uh, a very uh, exciting moon. Uh, Saturn uh, during the equinox. Uh, Huygens image after landing compared to some uh, river a bed in, uh, on Earth. And uh, this is a Pac-Man moon. Uh, really, this is, uh, I guess it's Iapetus, is it? Mimas, oh, I'm sorry, Mimas, I knew someone. So this is Mimas, which looks like Pac-Man. This is a thermal map of Mimas, very strange. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, a few words about, um, about Enceladus. I mean, this is really what makes the moon so exciting. I mean, there are jets of water, vapor, uh, ice, crystal coming from the in inside of, uh, of Enceladus. And in fact, those uh, features have been first discovered, I could say, uh, by the magnetometer, which during the first flyby, of the moon discovered some strange effect due to the, um, 
to something which looks like an atmosphere. So it really hinted that uh, there was really something strange going on at Enceladus, and eventually during the next flybys, and um, imaging and so on really looked at what was going on, and this is what's going on, and this is uh, another uh, a closer view of some of the observation in, uh, well, it's called E8 November, probably 2009. Uh, I don't have the date, but a rather recent observation, and there are so many jets coming out of uh, um, fractures in the surface of, uh, in the icy crust of Enceladus. So it points, and I think there are lots of, there is lots of evidence now that there is some liquid water inside the ice crust, which uh, really makes Enceladus a very unique body in, in the solar system. Uh, another image I like, this is a Saturn at Equinox, so as I start to uh, be running late, um, I will skip a few slides. So this is one slide I got regarding what the Lumia probe is uh, doing at, um, at Saturn. And um, as uh, Jan-Erik Valun is, uh, is saying, this is really crucial for understanding the space plasma aeronomy at Titan. I mean, this instrument was really uh, designed for Titan. And in fact, it does a, a great job at Titan. It measures uh, a certain number of parameters, in fact, more parameters than uh, <coughs> it was designed for, including the, the spacecraft potential. And I will show uh, how it can be used. And um, in fact, the spacecraft potential can be used to probe very low densities, which the Lumia probe itself cannot probe. But by using it as a proxy, you can go down to extremely low uh, densities. Uh, so this is illustrating uh, what it does at Titan. I mean, it really uh, studies the ionosphere, and this, this was designed to study the ionosphere. And it has observed a certain um, number of features, uh, the structure and the thermal state of the atmosphere as function of the zenith, the solar zenith angle, the ram angle, the altitude, uh, also latitude dependence. So a very rich um, a collection of data. So this is just to, to show the, uh, the power of such a tiny, uh, simple instrument in principle. But I tell you, there is a lot behind in the analysis of those, uh, of those data, uh, which, are le which is led by Jan-Erik Valun. So very, uh, very uh, powerful instrument. Um, it also allows, I mean, in using the proxy method, it allows to probe the uh, very low density uh, plasma down to 10 minus 2 or perhaps 10 minus 3. So it's really possible. Uh, by using this uh, proxy method. And I just want to show that here they even see the famous uh, rotational modulation we see in many parameters, uh, plasma parameters, magnetic field, etc., uh, which uh, is one of the big puzzles uh, because um, there is uh, lots of questions regarding the uh, variability of the, <coughs> of the modulation it's not exactly at the rotation period. And um, <clears throat> uh, this is, for me, one of the fascinating subjects under study uh, by Cassini. And it was supposed to be discussed here, but I don't have the audio, so I will uh, skip that. Uh, this is uh, summarized here, what Cassini uh, is, obs is observing, uh, the rotational, well, the frequency, modulation frequency of our modulation period of the Saturn kilometrical radiation. And in fact, two frequencies have been discovered. Uh, one which is due uh, to an emission coming from the south, one coming from the north, and they are eventually varying along the season, and they just crossed each other, so the frequencies became equal a few months after equinox, and now the, the, the crossover happened. And, uh, the south uh, frequency, is, the south period is decreasing, south frequency increasing, and vice versa. And in fact, Ulysses, and here I come back to Ulysses, was the first to point that the radio frequency the, of the Saturn kilometric radiation was varying and somewhat different from the one observed by Voyager. 
So really, Yuri just pointed out to uh, this, um, this phenomenon, which has been uh, pursued and really explored, and I believe now explained by Cassini. And in fact, in this paper by Gurnett, uh, you know, a few months ago, I think they went back to, to the Ulysses observation, and they were able to figure out that Ulysses, although I think this was not noted at that time, had also seen this uh, double frequency, one from the south, one from the north, and the crossover as well, a few months after equinox. And even Voyager, I think they went back to Voyager, there was some hint that there were two frequencies. So this is, uh, this is very interesting. So this is one, um, one illustration of a big, uh, a big research field at the moment uh, regarding the rotational modulation of uh, several parameters at Sadion. And I think uh, this is probably going to last um, uh, the world case mission to explain fully what's going on uh, at Sadion. So I move to Titan. Uh, so Titan, the largest moon of Sadion, as observed by Voyager. So this was uh, just an orange ball uh, with some features. Uh, for example, uh, clearly, clearly a contrast between the north and the south um, hemisphere, which of course has been explained. Uh, the atmosphere of uh, Titan is mostly nitrogen with methane. And there is, because of the methane, a complex organic chemistry uh, which is at work. And, uh, in the atmosphere of Titan, and Cassini, in fact, is really confirming that the complex chemistry is really initiated at high altitude in the atmosphere, uh, in fact, in the ionosphere. Uh, two uh, numbers, uh, the surface pressure is uh, 1.5 bar, and the temperature minus 179 Celsius, so <clears throat> a dense atmosphere, uh, inflated atmosphere compared to the Earth, and uh, very cold. And this is where a Titan eventually uh, went through under parachute. And this is illustrating, sorry for the, uh, I have a couple of slides with some French word, uh, but this is a, the Huygens mission on the 14th of January. Uh, Huygens was released by Cassini uh, uh, three weeks earlier on 25th of December 2004. And on 14th of January, it entered. Uh, and with its seed shield and eventually deployed its three parachutes to descend <coughs> in the atmosphere and land on the surface. And it even survived for more than three hours on the surface, which was completely unexpected. We uh, transmitted data on two radio channels. Unfortunately, on the uh, Cassini side, the Huygens, one of the Huygens receivers was not switched on properly, so we only decoded one of the two channels, but we had the, I should not say the fortune, but we, we, <clears throat> we had somewhat prepared for collecting the critical information which would have been lost otherwise with a, a set of a radio telescope on Earth <clears throat> using a, a VLBI, uh, several telescopes within a VLBI network. So there was single reception at two of the largest dish uh, at Green Bank and, um, and um, parks in Australia, which recovered the <coughs> Doppler signal that would have otherwise been lost as we lost the channel, the direct channel to Cassini, which was carrying this information. So all in all, although we lost uh, one, uh, one channel, we have recovered a real good data set, in fact, a complete data set, which allowed us to do uh, all the science although some investigations suffered a little bit from the fact that some of the data were lost. So this is one of the first set of images, a montage of three images, which has been released uh, the day of the landing, showing the uh, very uh, intricate um, network of channels on the surface of Titan. Uh, this is an, um, a panorama which has been built by someone who is not a member of, uh, of uh, the Huygens team, but who, re who has really some good knowledge in image processing and putting uh, three, four, so, uh, three, 400 images together. So this is one of the nice uh, panorama showing what Huygens uh, has seen. Um, so this is the image uh, from Huygens. Uh, Huygens returned black and white images. This is once we were on the surface. And the uh, 
uh, the color was obtained from uh, a spectrometer and uh, the colorization was made assuming that there was uniform uh, color in the whole image. Uh, and you, you, you have here the dimension of some of the details which have been seen by, by the Huygens. Uh, so this is the um, same image and with some artistic rendering of what it may look like around Huygens. So Huygens landed on the wet surface, I and mean, there are several evidences that some evaporation uh, took place, and uh, this is emphasized maybe a bit too much here that there was some uh, vapor from methane, ethane, and other products but mostly methane evaporating from the surface, and this has been measured by a couple of instruments. Uh, so this is uh, showing a very recent uh, um, result from the Huygens gas chromatograph mass spectrometer at three different altitudes, both are average spectra, and uh, at uh, high altitude, 130, 120 kilometers, uh, at low altitude, tw 20 to 10 kilometers on the surface. And clearly the spectrum on, on the surface is much richer than the, uh, the information uh, obtained during the, um, the, the descent. And really the surface is, um, well the, the instrument, Huygens, was not designed to, to function fully on the surface, although it continued uh, functioning properly, but the interpretation, the quantitative, quantitative interpretation of such measurement is, uh, requires some work and uh, in fact a project is being set up at, uh, at Goddard or Michigan to, um, uh, to um, try to interpret quantitatively the measurement, the rich measurement which have been made by Huygens on, on the surface. And it may take another couple of years to get the, the true science out of those data, but really rich, uh, rich data. Uh, as I'm running late, uh, just show this without uh, commenting in detail. I mean, Titan is a wonderful world. It has lots of similarities in terms of uh, geophysical processes, meteorology, uh, many features that we know on Earth are happening on Titan. So they, a very rich, rich world, and uh, it's really a fascinating world, and uh, uh, Cassini has a lot to do to, um, to decode all the information that's, uh, that's available at Titan. So, uh, so this is just showing a few of the features we are seeing. But as I'm running late, the surface of Titan, uh, this is a radar coverage each time. Uh, a flyby is dedicated to the radar, and it's not each flyby. The radar is making one, uh, one swath. So slowly, the radar coverage is increasing, and hopefully, the coverage will, um, will be um, at high resolution uh, between best resolution is 300 meters up to one or two kilometers, uh, maybe half of the moon will be covered by the radar. And we see here some of the lakes which have been observed by the radar and of course by the other remote sensing instrument, uh, the visual infrared mapping spectrometer, VIMS, and the camera. Uh, so the interior of Titan, this is a, an old illustration but there is uh, a, a big, thick ice crust. How thick it is, uh, this is a question that Cassini is trying to answer. Maybe Huygens, with one of its measurements, has provided an answer. The Huygens answer is that the, uh, the thickness would be of the order of 45 kilometers, and then there is liquid water uh, sandwiched with an, um, high pressure ice, and then the silicate core. So, um, the uh, internal structure is also one of the objectives uh, that Cassini is, uh, is pursuing. Now, uh, a glimpse into the future. Um, I don't need a crystal ball for everything, but uh, it may be needed for some. So first, the overview of the Cassini mission. Uh, this is illustrating in a very rich uh, slide uh, the Cassini mission unto, until 2017, so the Titan flybys, Enceladus flybys, uh, we will have a gap in a few years. Uh, the calendar year is here, uh, but eventually 
in 2016, we have uh, other flybys. And at the end of the mission, uh, a very a Cassini will be put placed in, a, in an orbit which, will, which we call a Juno, Juno-like orbit. Juno is going to be, uh, to be inserted in a, a quasi-polar uh, orbit around Jupiter, and Cassini is also going to be inserted, is planned to be inserted in the similar orbit at Sadion. So unique mission, almost a new mission in itself in 2017, which will really allow to explore a completely new region of Sadion and also the interior of Sadion. So uh, to conclude, Rosetta, so this is a mission that we are all waiting for in ESA. Uh, Rendezvous with a comet arrival in 2014. And of course, uh, as I am a landing person, I like to, I'm really very excited by, by the landing element Philae, which will be, uh, uh, which will land on the nucleus of, of the comet. So really looking forward to this, to this event. Uh, Baby Colombo is in development for launch in 2014. So this is a mission which is in collaboration between JAXA and ESA, two spacecraft, um, the planetary orbiter provided by ESA and the uh, magnetospheric orbiter uh, provided by JAXA. Uh, the ExoMars mission uh, now in uh, implementation between ESA and NASA, two missions, the Trace Gas Orbiter 2016, I think this is well on its way, with uh, a lander, a demonstration lander uh, to be provided by ESA. The, <clears throat> uh, the 2018 mission with the two rovers is, uh, as you know, there was a, a decadal survey in the States. I mean, we have close collaboration, not only on the Mars exploration, but also in the cosmic vision uh, uh, program in, between ESA and NASA, and the decadal survey outcome may uh, call for some re, uh, I should say, re-engineering uh, some of the established collaboration, and especially for the Mars 2018 rover mission. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> we'll see what happens. And my last slide is the one on EGSM. I mean, we had designed a wonderful mission. Uh, we have designed a wonderful mission. Uh, two spacecraft mission, uh, ESA uh, JGO, Jupiter Ganymede Orbiter, uh, NASA Jupiter Europa Orbiter, uh, really addressing fundamental question at Jupiter, fundamental question that uh, respond to question from the previous decadal survey, but also from the ESA cosmic vision document. Uh, unfortunately, um, as, uh, as an outcome of the decadal survey is not, um, is not fully positive, uh, it depends how you want to say it, is not fully positive with JEO. Uh, the, the mission is, um, is being uh, re, rethought in a sense, and there is a lot of uh, work going on at the moment within ESA uh, to, um, to find ways, not only for J, for EGSM, by the way, for the three L-class mission, the XO X-ray mission and also the LISA mission to readjust the mission definition to the outcome of the uh, NASA decadal survey on the NASA uh, process. So um, um, I, I don't know what, uh, how this mission will turn out, but clearly uh, we, as, uh, we had really designed a very exciting element of, of the mission, the Jupiter Ganymede Orbiter, and I hope that soon this mission uh, will be eventually adopted and this will be the next uh, outer planet mission for ESA and, and NASA. And I will not show that. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much um, for an excellent tour of, of the solar system. Um, we have time for a few questions. Are there any questions or comments? If not, I'll thank you again, and we'll see you in the award ceremony at 5 p.m. today. Thank you for attending. <laughs>